This is lesson two for module four, gears and drivetrains. In this lesson, I will talk about bearings, gears, gear sets, and ratios, also gearboxes and wind turbine drivetrains. Bearings prevent scraping metal to metal contact by providing cushion between the rotating and stationary surfaces. Plain bearings use oil in between smooth metal surfaces to reduce friction, and ball or roller bearings use lubricated metal rollers between the metal surfaces. Here is a tapered roller bearing. It has an angled race, so it may be used in cases where both axial and radial forces are present. You can see the rollers taper inward towards the top. The use of this type of bearing would be for a wheel bearing on an automobile. Also these grid patterns shown are for scale. Each section is approximately one quarter inch apart. needle type roller bearings, this particular one having a stud type track roller. The track encases and revolves with the rollers. Oftentimes needle bearings are just inserted with grease into an outer race with the inner race being the shaft itself. These are ideal for small static loads and dynamic loads where radial forces exist. The use of a needle bearing without the track would be on a drive shaft universal joint. Here is a self-aligning dual race ball bearing. This type of ball bearing allows its inner race to pivot slightly. So you can see it's sort of arched between the outer, outer edges of the inner race and the inside of the outer race is tapered as well. So once the bearings are inserted, the center point where the shaft would go through is able to pivot from side to side slightly, still while maintaining the ball bearings within the track. And these types of bearings are used where the shafts become slightly misaligned, such as a carrier bearing. Dynamic loads are forces on bearings while they are in motion. A bearing's maximum static load, that is the weight it can handle while not in motion, depends on its construction. It is the radial and or axial forces that the bearing is subjected to while at rest. Some bearings are designed to handle heavy static loads. Others work best when the forces are dispersed evenly, such as when the bearing is rotating. Bearings have both a static and dynamic load rating. Bearing pillow blocks. A pillow block is basically an encasement for the bearing. It provides a housing so it can be bolted to a chassis or some framing. On a wind turbine, the shafts, the high speed and low speed shafts, are mounted into bearing pillow blocks. These have grease certs. Grease can be added while performing maintenance. And here in a larger 1.5 megawatt wind turbine, the bearing pillow block encases the bearing. The bearing is bolted in and the pillow block is bolted to the bed plate. This is a very large bearing. The entire bearing pillow block is approximately four feet wide. They have to hold the stresses created by the rotor and by the large shaft itself. We'll get into bearings more during maintenance courses. Removal and installation of smaller bearings usually requires a hand operated press in case the bearings are not held within a cassette. They are sometimes pressed in. A hydraulic press may remove them or a simple arbor press. Gears. 
Gears when paired up provide a means to increase torque while at the same time decrease RPM and vice versa. Like on a bicycle which uses sprockets and chains, a high gear, gear ratio is used for high speed travel but it requires more torque on the bike pedal. Middle ratio provides medium torque and slight pressure on the pedal. The low ratio is best for low speed uphill travel and it requires less torque but a higher RPM at the pedal. This helps explain the differences in gear ratios and also it should be known that the power is only being transferred in these scenarios. No power is actually gained. Gear types. There are spur gears which are the basic clockmaker style gears the teeth are straight across. It's a simple gear. Here is a set of gears together. Bevel gears. Bevel gears are cut at an angle to allow for the axis of rotation to change. In other words, from a vertical axis rotation, such as this one, to a horizontal axis rotation. Helically cut gears have a special diagonal cut in the teeth to better distribute axial and radial force between them. There are also helical bevel gears. Worm gears. Here is the input worm gear and the output gear. These gears are ideal for very low gear ratios. The one at right has a 10 to 1 ratio. That is to say the worm gear must turn ten times to make the output gear turn once. Worm gears are quiet and provide a great amount of torque on the output shaft. Some output shafts are able to hold light, static, torsion loads since the worm gear cannot be rotated by the output gear. This sort of locks the output shaft in position when the worm gear is not being rotated. Notice the indentation of the output gear. This is not wear. It is designed like this to ensure good contact with the round worm gear. With these gear boxes, damage will occur if someone tries to use the worm gear as the output gear. Rack gears are used to change rotational motion into linear motion and vice versa. A CD-ROM drive tray is shown as an example. They also may have helical teeth. Gear sets. Here's the input gear, the idler gear, and the output gear. The idler gear does not have anything to do with the overall ratio. It just acts as an idler in between. So this input gear turns the idler and the output gear will turn in the same direction as the input gear. That is the purpose of the idler. A little bit on the dimensions and the parameters of gears. The overall diameter is from the the angle that the force comes into contact with the second gear is called the pressure angle. Gearboxes. Gearboxes house a combination of different gear types and gear ratios to achieve an overall ratio with desired performance and suitable power rating. Here is a gearbox from a 75 to 100 kilowatt model. Here is the rotor's hub, the low speed shaft, the gearbox, an overspeed braking system, access plates to bearings, the case, which is bolted together housing rods, bearings, and the gears, the high speed shaft. A drivetrain is required for some wind turbines where the rotor's rotation rate is not suitable for the generator. They are made up of shafts, gearboxes, couplers, bearings, and sometimes braking systems. Some wind turbine blades rotate slowly with great force, that is to say torque. 
However, this slower rotation rate is not suitable for some generators. A great amount of wind turbines use induction generators that have a required synchronous speed. In other words, they will not produce power if rotated below a certain number of RPM. Most induction generators reach synchronous speed around 1700 RPM. This is way faster than rotors can turn. Most large rotors only turn from about 5 to 20 RPM. Since the induction generator in the previous example reaches a synchronous speed or power producing speed at around 1700 RPM, an increase in the rotor's low RPM is required. This is accomplished by the use of a gearbox having a high gear ratio. Gearboxes house two or more gears in order to change the low RPM of the rotor into a higher speed for the generator. This change in RPM is given by a ratio. If a generator requires a minimum of 1700 RPM and the rotor turns at about 15 RPM, a gearbox with an overall ratio of a little over 1 to 100 would be required. Of course, this does not take into effect the ranges of wind speeds versus rotor speed and other performance conditions. A ratio of 1 to 25 or 1 to even 50 would be a little more realistic. Also, with doubly fed induction generators and other types of generators, it is not necessary to keep the high speed shaft right at around 1700 RPM. This is just an example. Some engineers are working on continuously variable transmissions to ensure better performance over a wider range of rotor speeds. Terms for this lesson, balls, needles, roller, self-aligning, the outer and inner races of bearings, and their construction, drive trains, dynamic load, gear ratios, gear boxes, bevel, helical, rack, and worm gears, pillow blocks, RPM, static load, and synchronous speed. Also, it should be known that the power of a rotating shaft is the product of the torque and its rate. The equation is horsepower equals torque times RPM, all of that divided by 5,252. That is a close approximation. Remember, with gearboxes, horsepower is not gain, only RPM is changed and torque. As you may recall, torque is the force, the angular force, acting on a shaft. You should have the reading done. Do not forget the assignment. And this ends module four. There are only two lessons for this module. You need to take the lesson two quiz over this PowerPoint and the reading. And also, before this unit is finished, you need to complete the module four lessons one and two test. For the next unit, we will talk about the grid and power distribution.